Dateline, February the 4th, 1999. The place, New York City. Amadou Diallo, a 23-year-old West African immigrant, was shot and killed when police officers fired 41 times as the young man stood outside of his apartment building. Amadou's mother, Kadiatu, was interviewed by CBS News after the tragic death of George Floyd just a few months ago because she was reliving what happened to her son all over again. As the mother of Amadou watching what's happened to Mr. Floyd was like having my wounds opened all over again, she said. Amadou's mother has become an activist working to improve relations between police and the community. She said George Floyd's heartbreaking last minutes of life in which he repeatedly said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and begged for his mother, struck a chord deep in her. Every mother heard him, she said. All mothers heard the cry of George Floyd, and his voice still rings in our ears. In the early morning hours of February 4 of 1999, Amadou was standing outside of his building when four white plainclothes police officers drove by. One of the officers claimed he thought Amadou matched the general description of a rapist that had been reported a year earlier. A witness claimed the officers gave no warning when they opened fire. The four officers were charged with second-degree murder and acquitted. Kadiatu said her final conversation with her son was a happy one. She said the last time we spoke on January 31st, when he said to me, Mom, I'm so happy. I've saved enough money. I'm going to college. Well, it was that phrase, that phrase that grabbed the composer Joel Thompson as one of the texts that he included in his stunningly reflective composition called The Seven Last Words of the Unarmed. Eric played a couple of movements from that marvelous work just a few moments ago. The police said they thought Amadou was reaching for a gun. He was actually reaching for his wallet to give the officers his identification. According to his mother, Amadou had no criminal record. He didn't own a gun. He never even had a traffic ticket in New York City. According to his mother, Amadou was a young, generous, bright, and promising young man whose death makes no sense, and simply retelling his story is breaking my heart once more. I'm sure everybody can remember a happy time in life when you could hardly wait to share good news with your parents. If you happen to be a parent, you can relate to the feelings of that mother who no doubt replays the tape of her son's excitement in announcing, I've saved my money. Mom, I'm going to college. Only to have the dream crushed and buried within a few days after an unimaginable outcome as the result of a mistaken identity. I believe all of us relate with stories, not statistics. Statistics are heady, they're distant, they're cold. Anybody can read the statistical analysis 
and explain or excuse or dismiss any inconceivable event because it's so distant from our story. But the reality is, it is our story, isn't it? Amadou's story has become our story. Stories put flesh and blood on the statistics that lifts a number out of the accountant's column and puts a face and a name on a death that makes it unforgettable. Surely you know what I mean. While 200,000 deaths are unfathomable to us by any standard as a result of the COVID-19 virus, that enormous number does not get a hold of us emotionally until someone we know has been deathly ill or died as a result of contracting the virus. The significance of a death changes dramatically when we identify with a person and their story. While dementia is the primary cause of over 275,000 deaths every year, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it was more of a statistic to me until I sat at the bedside of my mother who died this past February from complications brought on by her mental, emotional, and physical decline. Betty's death wasn't just another death in the CDC column called Alzheimer's disease. Betty was my mom who had a name. She had a story. Friends, we cannot we must not dehumanize tragedy by minimizing death while cloaking it in the garb of statistics. Which is why, friends, that saying the names, saying the names is so important. Say the names of innocent lives that have been taken from us. Say the names of the tragic and needless deaths that have occurred because of the color of someone's skin. Say the names. Speak the names of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Sandra Blond, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Amadou Diallo, and so many, many others that we name and re remember and grieve their loss. Their deaths must not be in vain. You see, saying a name identifies a face and a family and a community, a story of a life lived with hopes and dreams and challenges and defeats. Saying a name is an invitation to know their story and to value their life. Their names need to be spoken with reverence. Speaking a name is more than just another tick in the column of the death statistics. You see, friends, the more we know about each person, the more we'll grieve. The more we grieve the loss of our black or brown neighbors, the more we feel their absence and the senselessness of their deaths. The more we feel the struggle and the pain of their loved ones, the less satisfied we are with our complacency about that death. And the less complacent we are, the more motivated we become to take action in exerting our influence to stop the scenario of racial violence and death that seems to be like a needle stuck in the groove of an old, old record playing over and over 
and over again. The truth is, all lives will not matter until black lives matter. For generations, centuries, people of faith have read the directive from the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill. It's more than a slogan used as a TV show title. It's more than a marketable book title. It's more than an ancient aspiration. The law of God is clear. Do not commit murder. As is often the case when we do biblical study, the interpretation of the phrasing has a wide range of meanings that describe any destructive activity, including, including breaking or dashing to pieces, to slay or kill or murder. But in the Christian traditions, when we take yet another step, and seriously look at and practice the teachings of Jesus found in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus goes beyond the willful taking of a life to examine the attitude or motives behind the behavior. Jesus was bold enough to state that anger that boils to the point of violence is as unacceptable as the act of murder. It is clear, friends, clear, that God's best plan for humanity is to value another person's life so as to not end that life. Life is a gift from God. Life is sacred. But humanity has always struggled with the implementation of that value. I think of all the scriptures that challenge me from the New Testament. The passage that I read to you from Romans 7 is a snapshot of the internal battle that all of us face in the process of decision making. Remember how Paul phrased it? I don't really understand myself because I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Paul's not the only one who struggles with such a battle, is he? We all struggle with doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Most of us know full well what we ought to do. Most of us know that when we see something that is not right, we ought to say something. But who wants a hassle? Nobody wants a hassle. Yet we all know it. Something is wrong today. Something is morally reprehensible. Something needs to change for us to live life where everyone is valued equally, where everyone is treated with respect, where everyone is given equal justice under the law, and where there is no difference in how folks are treated, whether they have white skin or a person of color. Friends, if we see inequalities, if we see violence, and we don't do something to challenge it or change it, can we live with ourselves when hate and violence and death becomes even more of an epidemic than it is today? Friends, for God's sake, for God's sake, don't accept innocent lives being taken from us without doing something, without saying something, without getting involved to change this awful, awful narrative. 
in the name of the one who created us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. It is my prayer that through the music, the prayers, the scriptures, or the spoken word, that God's Spirit has visited you where you are and strengthened you in your resolve in both faith and action. There's no question about it, we are living in a difficult season of the human journey. The fears, the anxieties, the concerns that we are attempting to navigate today are emotionally depleting and physically exhausting. And yet, friends, in the face of crisis, we dare not back away from our challenges. Be strong, be courageous, be prayerful, knowing that God is with us as light for our journey. Our opening hymn actually gave us a prayer. It's appropriate for this moment. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. May that be our prayer today and in all the days ahead. Amen. <laughs> 